So this talk is on how to stop scope creep once and for all. Do you like my little WAPU? Y'all, that came from WAPU.us. You, are you aware of this place? I didn't know about this website. They have WAPUs for everything. And, and some of the um, word camps even get them to do one for their mascot. For their, uh, but this is the scope creep WAPU. And it's a, they classify him as a villain. Um, does anybody else feel that scope creep is evil? Right, of course. It's the bane of our existence, is it not? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you the secret sauce on how to stop scope creep once and for all. So a little bit about me. My name is Beth Livingston. Um, I have my business is WP Roadmaps, and my website's WPRoadmaps.com, and there's my email address. Um, I started out as a business analyst in corporate IT, and um, that's where I cut my teeth on this, uh, this whole concept of the six principles of productivity management, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, in 2013, I um, had developed, I had an idea to develop a web app for grocery savings, and I presented it at Startup Weekend, the first time it was ever held in the triad of North Carolina, and we won third place, and it was great. And then I worked on that for about three years, and when I got ready to launch it, the economy had improved so much that it was kind of obsolete. <laughs> so I had built a number of WordPress websites in the process, and so that's when I became a WordPress coach. And I've been helping small businesses um, basically uh, increase their productivity by use of web technology and process, and mostly by helping them build effective websites. Um, recently, I did a slight pivot in that I have really been seeing a need among WordPress practitioners for how to stop scope creep, how to do project management. Um, I know that a lot, it appears to me after going to many word camps that uh, there are a lot of agencies who have a great creative and a great development team, but they don't really have anybody that has that project manage, not, management knowledge. So I'm in the process of developing some online courses that will be available on my website, but that's um, a few months down the road. So what you're going to learn during this presentation is what are the six principles of productivity management? How can those six principles help stop scope creep? Which of those two principles are the most critical in stopping scope creep? And then how to apply those two principles to a WordPress project. So what are the six principles? The six principles are really just common sense methods for getting your jobs done on time and within budget. And we all know that we're supposed to do these things, but sometimes we lose track of them when we're actually pulling off a project. Um, this can equally be applied to whether you are tiling your kitchen floor <laughs> or doing a project at church or um, a website project. It, the, the six principles are kind of um, universal in that way. And where did they come from? Well, believe it or not, they did come from corporate America. Yes, we all believe now that corporate America is evil. However, there are some good things that come out of there, and this was one of them. I, once upon a time, worked for a company called Keen based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And the founder of that company wrote a book called The Six Principles of Productivity Management, and it honestly changed my life. And one of these days, I'm going to write a book about that. Um, and it's important to remember, as we talk about these six principles, that this is not project management. You should have a project management methodology. This is productivity management that kind of sits on top of or runs through your project management methodology, whichever methodology you're using, whether you're using an agile methodology or using a waterfall whatever you're using for your software development and your project management, this should run all the way through it. So here are the principles. Keen's six principles are on the left. And on the right, I have modified them slightly to apply to WordPress. And that is define the job in detail. We know we're supposed to do this, right? But if you define that job in detail with WordPress, you also need to start with a content-first approach. How many people find that it takes forever to get all the content from the client? Right. Well, if you, just, if you refuse to start till they give you all the content, chances are you're going to get more of it, if not all of it, before you start. I, because, honestly, how long does it take to actually build a website, y'all? Not that long. <laughs> 
what takes a long time is getting all that stuff together from the client. So if you just concentrate on doing that before you write the first line of code or, or create the first page, it will help in stopping scope creep. Because how many times do, as soon as they start to gather that content, they go, oh, and I forgot that, right? Because they, they pulled some content and went, oh, yeah, we need this on there too. So if you do all that first, then you get that defined up front. Get the right people involved was the first principle, but in WordPress, you not only need to get the right people involved, but you need to get the right plugins involved. Am I right? Okay, as you're looking at these, try to figure out what you think are the two most important ones, okay? And then later on, we'll talk about what they are. Okay, then we've got this, you know, estimate the time and cost. That's for every project, no matter what. There's no difference. Break the job down, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, what that actually means. Establish a change procedure. That's really good. You establish that change procedure up front, you tell the client what it is, and then when the client wants to make a change, what do you say? Well, I'll just throw that in. That's going to be easy. It's going to take me five minutes. I'll just throw that in. Then what does the client want the next time? Just throw that in. It's not, it can't be that hard, right? So that's how that scope creep starts, right? So you have to take a really strong attitude about it and just stick to it. So that's why I, the, my, my sixth principle, my fifth principle for WordPress is not only establish that change procedure, but you have to stick to it. And then establish acceptance criteria. And, that, and I've changed it that not only do you have to establish acceptance criteria for how do we know we're done, how many times have you thought you were done and the client said, well, you're not done, we still have, right? Because they forgot, so, or they thought they had told you something. So it's very important to have that written down at the beginning as well. Now, I'm going to stop here for one second, and I'm going to read you the foreword of a book called Cultural Calamity. It was written by Joe Mayo. He is an internationally known project manager and risk manager, and he was a colleague of mine when I worked at Keene. But this kind of describes this whole, look, this is kind of like a cult. <laughs> it was for us when we worked there um, because... We were, you had to follow this. It was, it was our, our credo. So let me read you this real quick as soon as I bring it up here on my phone. The culture endured for decades and was unfazed by market conditions, massive growth through acquisitions and numerous technology evolutions. The heart and soul of the culture was very simple and was centered on a book written by the founder and his wife called The Six Principles of Productivity Management. Productivity management was written in response to a significant number of project failures that occurred in the 1970s. The founder commissioned a study of these project failures by an independent institution to understand what went wrong. The study identified six causes that the failed projects had in common, which gave birth to the book. There was nothing magical about the six principles. They were mostly common sense, but they described the founder's philosophy about how people should be treated and set forth a common approach for conducting business. Productivity management wasn't a tome. It was less than 200 pages, but it described basic concepts that applied to any type of work. What was different is that everyone in the entire company embodied the six principles and lived by them every day. Anyone who joined Keene was given a hardbound copy of productivity management on his first day, and they were required to attend formal productivity management training within 90 days of joining the company. Hold on. It didn't matter if you were an administrative assistant or a vice president, you got the book. You read the book, you took the training. As a quality assurance manager, I attended all executive management reviews in my region. At one particular review, there were some new managers and a new vice president. After introductions, the senior vice president asked the new managers and the vice president when they were scheduled for productivity management training. The new vice president said, I've been in this business over 30 years, and I'm pretty sure there's nothing in that class that I don't already know. The senior vice president's response was swift and decisive. He said, if you want to work here, you better complete that training before your next review. The new vice president didn't complete the training and was gone shortly thereafter. What is important about this is that everyone across the global enterprise knew the six principles and how to apply them. Keene had operations in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and India. It was possible to walk into any project in any location and be productive almost immediately because everyone followed the same core principles and used the same terminology. So that's why this is so powerful. If you can use it consistently, it really does work. And the principles are based on 
the idea that a plan is just a plan. I think we get caught up into, what well, we've given them the estimate, we've given them the project plan, now that's carved in granite. And if you set that expectation at the beginning, then you're gonna have trouble. But if you set the expectation of, look, this is just a plan. It's more like a GPS and less like a roadmap, right? Because you're gonna run into something or you're gonna take a wrong turn and it's gonna say, rerouting, right? And you have to do that throughout the course of the project. So. I'm just going to read this statement off the slide. Instead, we should head out on our journey with a well-thought-out and well-defined plan, understanding that discoveries made along the way may change the route taken as well as the final destination. And this is one of my favorite sayings from Abraham Lincoln. If you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four sharpening the axe. And that's the other premise, as I said before. It doesn't take long to build the website. It takes a long time to design the website and, and figure out how it's going to look. And everything, everything needs to be in writing. Assumptions get you into trouble every time. So, um, I mean, everybody's heard this. You've seen it probably in people's cubes, right? Adopt, if it isn't in writing, it didn't happen. But you really have to take that attitude. Excuse me, I was saying earlier, I do musical theater sometimes, and I am never nervous because I'm pretending to be somebody else. But when you're up here doing your own thing, it's a little different. I'm getting the dry mouth, so excuse me. Okay, so how do these six principles help stop the scope creep? Well, I'm going to go through this part kind of quick because we're going to delve down into the two that are the most important and talk about those in a little more detail. Okay, so the first, and keep thinking about which two you think are the most important. Okay, so the first one's to find the job in detail with a content-first approach. So if you use a drill-down method, and what I do in my proposals is I never give, this is another one of the principles is to avoid, it's like a sub-principle, is to avoid early precise estimates. So in my proposals, I always give a range of cost and a range of time. And if they agree to that, that becomes the contract. But... Um, then we drill down later into that detailed statement of work. When, the, when we do the detailed statement of work, if, if that, if, then when you re-estimate, if you've gone outside of that range, I give the client the option to back out. Now, nine times out of ten, they don't, because we've already set the expectation that there's, you know, we're, we're going to do our best to discover everything on the front end, but we're going to acknowledge up front that we're probably not going to get it right. The second step is get the right people and plugins involved. So there's always a set of roles that get fulfilled on every website project, right? You got a project manager, you got um, a developer, you've got a designer, and you may be doing all of those roles, but they're still separate roles. They don't have to be separate people to be separate roles. So what I do is I have a standard list of roles and responsibilities that I have in my proposal template, and I um, go through that. I modify it for each client. And I also have the roles that the client's going to fulfill and what those responsibilities are so that they can see that this is not just a hand it over to me and I'll take care of it. You, we're going to be both involved in this process. I do the same thing with a set of technical. Everybody's got their favorite technical plugins, right? You got your favorite image compression plug-in, you've got your, your favorite um, page caching plug-in, we all do. So I have my list of technical plug-ins already decided, and then I modify that based on the needs of the specific client. And then I do the same thing with business function plug-ins like e-commerce. I mean, is there more than one? I'm just wondering. <laughs> Everybody uses WooCommerce. Actually, I have a site that I use a different one on, but... And then I customize that for each project. Then the next principle is estimate the time and cost, and I, I alluded to this earlier that you, you, just, you don't just estimate once, you estimate early and you estimate often. And these are all the different times that you could estimate. Now I am gonna switch over to my notes slide for just one second because I wanna read you another little statement that is very telling about estimating the cost. So if y'all will bear with me in looking at my notes page. <laughs> For years, project managers have searched in vain for the key to accurate estimating. We have combed ancient scriptures, prayed to divinities, and scaled treacherous ice-covered mountains to consult cave-dwelling sages. Somewhere out there must lurk the perfect algorithm that once fed a few, that once fed a few discrete variables gives the absolute accurate cost of a proposed project. Alas, we never found the algorithm, but we have gained enlightenment. 
The key is there is no key. <laughs> and it's sad, but it's true that with estimating, it's kind of a um, trial and error thing. You get better over time at, at, at estimating. Um, one of the things that is very, well, we'll get to that. Well, we'll get to it when we talk about change. Okay, breaking the job down. How many people are familiar with the agile method of development? Anybody? Okay. Those of us who've been around for a while know that all of those methodologies are the same stuff. They're just organized different with different names around it. John Keene actually came up with the sprint long before anybody else did it. He called it the 80-hour rule. And he required us to have a deliverable every 80 hours. It wasn't necessarily always a client deliverable, but there was a deliverable every 80 hours because that, at man hours, not just two weeks. Um, and that way, we always knew where we were within two weeks, within 80 hours. You knew I'm either this far behind or I'm this far ahead. So that's why it's important to have those uh, breaking the job down into small little chunks and, and doing an assessment as soon as, you know, every time you deliver one of those or do a sprint. It's the same thing. Establish and stick to a change procedure. Okay, so this should be in your, this should be in your proposal. It should be in your statement of work. And it should be something that you go over in great detail with the client and you tell them, just acknowledge the change up front. Acknowledge that we know we're going to miss some things. You're going to forget about some things. So here's what we're going to do. Remember that estimate we gave you? We're going to take 30% of that total and we're going to put it over here in this change bucket. So that estimate we gave you has now increased by 30%, but we're only going to use that change bucket if there's a change. That's how you always get your projects done within budget. Make, just acknowledge the change and set a chunk of money over there for it, and then that way you're always, well, I, don't say, I won't say always. If you are really bad at defining the job up front, then probably you might go over your change budget. But if you're really good at it up front, then you can get it done. You can set that amount so that chances are you aren't going to use the whole thing. You might use some of it, but you won't use it all. So acknowledge and actively manage that change throughout the project. And make sure the client, that you set that expectation with the client. This is a hard and fast rule. It's the way we do it, and we don't do it any other way. And then there's um, establishing the interim and acceptance criteria for the end. And that's another mistake we often make because we think, well, we just know when, I mean, it's there. Everything's there. It's done, you know. But you really need to set those specific acceptance criteria that are measurable so you'll know that you are done. And so the client will know you're done. Okay, so I'm going to go back up to our slide with the six on the left and six on the right. Hold on, I'll get there in a minute. Okay, so which two do you think are the most important? Oh, come on, this is an interactive thing. <laughs> Change procedure, of course, and then what's the other one? Right, define the job in detail and establish and stick to the change procedure. Define the job in detail with a content-first approach and then establish that interim and um, acceptance, I mean, um, then uh, establish the change procedure. Okay, but what's really interesting is that most of those others are also part of defining the job in detail. Okay, because to define the job in detail, you have to establish that acceptance criteria. You have to get the right people and plugins involved. That's another task of defining that job in extreme detail, breaking the job down, estimating the time and estimating the time and costs. So how do we apply those two most critical principles? Well, this is how I do it. <laughs> I start with a proposal questionnaire, and I've actually, in addition to the slides on my website, I've also included this proposal questionnaire. You're welcome. <laughs> um, hopefully you'll find it useful. It's just what I use to do that first high-level discussion with the client to get so I can at least give them an, um, an estimate for uh, approval. Then I have the proposal. I also put my proposal template 
on my website that you can look at too. Um, so then I take that questionnaire and I fill in the proposal. I walk through that with the client. We make any changes to it based on that walkthrough. And then we move to the next step, which is the project definition questionnaire. And it just has more specific questions, more details. How many people have ever um, taken the WP Elevation training? Anybody? Okay, so you know how Troy talks about going wide and deep? This is that same kind of process where you're saying, and I heard you talking about it earlier, where you go, why do you want this, right? This is, a, this is another piece that I think we forget to do all the time. We don't. Some people forget to do is you start talking about what should the website look like? What pages should it have? What should it, you know, but what you have not even discussed with the client, what are your business objectives? What are your business requirements? What is this website supposed to accomplish for your business? I don't care what it's going to look like. I don't care what kind of function it's going to have. Tell me how it's going to help your business. And by that having that discussion, not even talking about, talk about it like it's a brochure, not even like it's a website, that, you know, the client always wants to start designing on day one. And so you got to stop them from that and, get, and really get down and understand what their business requirements are. That's a big part of defining that job in detail. And you'd be amazed. Uh, Troy tells a story about how he um, was asking, why do you need a website? Why do you need an updated website? And the guy was kind of hemming and hawing and saying he needed it for this. And he needed, well, I just need more traffic, and I need more this, and I need more that. And he goes, and, and Troy's thing is you just keep asking why, why, why. And finally, he got down to the guy was going to sell the business. So that changed, I mean, that's a business requirement that changed his whole approach to how he was going to do that website, right? So that's why those kinds of questions, and sometimes it makes a client really annoyed or uh, uncomfortable, but you have to do it because it's the only way to find out and to find that job in detail and find out what those business requirements are. Then I create a statement of work, which is a lot of the proposal is repeated in the statement of work, but you get down and dirty into some really detailed ways, uh, d uh, detailed sections of how you're going to do business and detailed sections about what are your business requirements. Then again, you have that walk through with the client and make sure that you got it right. And then again, it's very revealing. Um, you'll learn a whole lot more um, by doing that walk through with the client. Then there's the work breakdown structure, which is basically how many people actually have a project plan and use it when they develop a website? Are you kidding me? <laughs> just make an Excel spreadsheet. It really helps. <laughs> um, and I, what I did was I just developed, I have a standard one that I use for every client, and then I just modify it based on, you know, like if they're not going to have e-commerce, I take out all that stuff. If they're not going to have, you know, this or that, I take those things out or I add things in. Um, and that's just basically a list of your activities and your tasks. And then I use a set of content gathering forms that I created that if, the, it, you know, I just hand them to the client and say, when you get this back to me is when we will start your project. If you, when, if you take six weeks to get this back, now we did an estimate based on we were going to start on this day. And we'll start on this day if you get me all this content. Now, are you going to get all the content? Probably not. But if you take that attitude that we're not starting until you give it to us, you'll get most of it. Now, and you can also, depending, like, let's say it's an updated website that you're doing, you can volunteer to get the content for them from the other site, but you still don't start building the site until they validate those content forms that this is exactly what they want on there. Because then when you go to develop the website and you get it done in, like, no time, you're a rock star in their opinion, right? If, you, if it's dragging out and dragging out because they're not giving you the content, they don't see themselves as the problem. They see you as the problem. So just take that, take that um, out of the equation. So this is kind of how the process, how the project definition process works. You start with that proposal questionnaire that feeds into the proposal. The proposal feeds into the statement of work, but your project definition questionnaire also feeds into the statement of work. And then all those other principles well, the work breakdown structure, and then all those other principles, the roles and responsibility, the time and cost estimates, the change management procedure, the acceptance procedure and criteria is all there in that statement of work. That statement of work, even though you, they agreed to do the project, if it came in in that range from the proposal, that range of time and that range of cost, and this is to validate 
let's, let's look at it this way. The proposal is what we're going to do, and this, the statement of work is how we're going to do it. Does that make sense? You can call it whatever you, you can call that statement of work something else, but that's what we used to call it back in the software development days. Okay, so you can't really see that um, sample from my proposal questionnaire, so you can, I'll give you the website link in a minute, but, uh, excuse me, I need another drink of water. So you can get, in a, you can get the, proposal template, but basically it's talking, um, it's asking questions like, is this an existing, existing website? What are the purposes and goals for the website? Who's going to host it? What, do you already have a domain name? You know, all those questions you have to ask. How many people use a checklist or something like this when they're talking to the client? Right. I mean, if you try to do it from scratch every time, you're going to forget something. So that's why it's important to have this thing that you follow every time. What kind of text and graphics are you going to need? That sort of thing. So these are the sections that I include in my proposal. Basically, what is the project request and snapshot? What's the background and the business requirements? And this, at this point in the proposal, really high level, you might have two or three business requirements, right? I want to drive more traffic. I need more customers to come into the shop. I need, you know, whatever those business requirements are. Then there's your scope. How many people define a scope for their clients? Really need to do that because you got it because you know and in the in scope stuff's not not the not the issue it's the out of scope stuff, so in that scope section you need to include what's in scope and also a very detailed list of what is out of scope. If you're not going to be building content, you need to make sure you write that down for your client because a lot of times they just make the assumption, am I right, that you're going to do the content too. Then here's your proposed solution and deliverables. You know, we're going to do a website. Here's the plugins we're going to use. Here's the, you know, the, so you put down your, what your solution is at a high level. Time and cost estimates, a range. It will fall between this and this. Change management, acceptance management. I always include a section for frequently asked questions because I get tired of answering the same questions over and over. <laughs> like, who's going to manage the website? Where is, you know, what do I do when I have a problem? You know, after you do this website, do I call you? Who do I call? And put all those things down in the, in the proposal. And, the, um, and then what are the next steps? You know, put in the, in the proposal, tell the client exactly what they need to do to accept that proposal. Go to my website, click on this link, pay me some money, and then we'll get started. Then I move to the more detailed project definition questionnaire which includes things like, um, in this example, who's going to approve these things? Who's the approver for each one of these deliverables? Um, that's just one section. The other sections, did I tell, no, I didn't put them in here. Um, did I include this on my website for you guys? No, I just did the proposal questionnaire and the proposal. These will be ready at a future date. But, um, so it's that kind of detail. Now you're putting in the specific names of the people from the client. You're putting in specifically who's going to do what and um, getting a lot more specific about that. Okay, so then in that statement of work, this, these are the sections that I typically include in a statement of work. Your project identification, which basically you just copy that over from the proposal because you already did that part. Your scope of effort. Now, while you were going through this que the second questionnaire, you've gotten a lot more detail. So now your scope, you're going to take that scope that you had in the proposal, and you're going to define that in a lot more detail. Are y'all getting tired of all this detail? The customer does too. But it is so important because if you do all of this up front, building the website takes no time at all. Oh, and it's really important in that scope section to put what's in scope that you're going to do, what's in scope that the client is going to do, and then what's out of scope. Because sometimes they don't realize that they have to approve stuff, they have to test stuff, do user acceptance testing. They don't realize that they have these, this time involvement, so you need to let them know up front because then they're going to be more likely to have the time, make the time in their schedule, put that on their list of things they need to do. Your management approach. Who are the required management resources? What's your, what, what is your process for communication? 
We all just make these assumptions that, well, we'll just call them if we need to talk to them, or they'll just call us if we need to talk. Well, who are you going to talk to at the client? And look, you know, if it's a really small client and there's two people, it's not too hard, okay? But listen, you know, you were talking about pretty large projects. You know, if you've got a large project with a large team, you need to really clearly define these things. Like, how is this communication going to happen? Who's, who do I escalate to if I get in a problem with my subject matter expert and, I, and we're in an impasse? Who do I escalate that to? It's real important to define all of that. And, your, of course, your team roles and responsibilities. And then your technical approach, that's the details, you know, hosting, the environment you're going to, like, are you going to have a staging environment and then move it over and uh, your work approach, what your deliverables are, what your technical plugins are. Your development approach, your time and cost, your change management, acceptance management. Most of this is the same as it was in the proposal. And then you give them examples in your appendix of all of the stuff that they're going to need to use during this, pro during this project. Your change request form, your acceptance forms. And see, if you do all this, you look so professional. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, and then, like, I always include in the appendix also what my website care plans are, um, if that's something that they um, are interested in. And I use that kind of as a, like a... Um, the opportunity to, to uh, sell them on those website care plans. But I don't, ma I don't generally make that part of the proposal. Um, I make it as something they need to think about adding on to. And here's an example of the first couple of sections of my work breakdown structure. And you see, I just use an Excel spreadsheet. But boy, does it help you to not forget stuff. And, and to stay on track. And if you break the job down so that in this work breakdown structure you have a deliverable every 80 hours, then you will always know if you're doing things on time, if you're getting things done early, late, or on time. And this is an example of a couple of my content gathering uh, forms that I use. The one on the left is for page content, so you've got your title, the slug, the page type, what kind of content is it? What are the SEO keywords? What are the images? Are we using a featured image? Is a plugin required for this page to, to do something? Um, it, does it need to have a sidebar? Those sorts of things. So those are the kind. Now, are all of those going to get filled in by the client on day one? No, but if they don't know what to fill in, then when you go over them with the client, you can fill those things. You can gather from them what they are, and you can fill them in. And then the other example I gave was like for testimonials. Okay, so how do we establish and stick to a change procedure? This is a change procedure we used to use at Keen. I still use it today. Um, I've left it in as, uh, I copied it from my template so it's got a spot to put in, you know, your client's name, your name, your business name, that sort of thing. So basically it reads like this. Anybody can request a change. The change goes, the change request, of course there's a form for the change request, that goes to the project manager. The project manager, now remember, that project manager might not be designated as project manager, especially if you're a solopreneur and you're doing your own thing just by yourself. You are the project manager. You analyze that change request, complete the form with the estimates on it, then you log that change request, especially if you anticipate there's going to be quite a few of them. Um, and then if you, ha if you have regular weekly status meetings, which I highly recommend, um, well, depending on the length of the project. If the project's three weeks long, I don't know about having one every week. But basically, you report on those changes in the status meetings as well. The project manager presents the change request to whoever's going to, whoever's responsible for approving them. Now, and let me say something about change, too. Change can be a change to the timeline can be a change to the cost. It could be a change to the resources, which doesn't affect time or cost. It can just be a change that has no impact. But if you don't document that change, then you don't remember to go back and test it you know, because you're, you're looking at your original set of requirements. So the other thing that the change request process does is it keeps you on track for um, making sure that you've got everything that you agreed to and then to make sure you test everything. So you give that to the, to the client representative who's responsible for approval, and they can approve or deny it in writing, and you give them a time frame. 
here's another thing, you know, th this needs to come back to me within three days because oftentimes you'll give them the change and then it takes a t couple of weeks to get the thing back and then there's, they don't understand that, okay, well that didn't, now we gotta change everything again because it took you so long to get that back to me. So um, I usually use three to five days as my time frame. And then you make it clear that if the client doesn't, re doesn't respond in that time frame that it'll be added as an item on the issues log. So it becomes, if, it, if it's a change, if they don't respond, that becomes an issue. And then uh, the project manager maintains those change control documents along with all the other project documentation. And then number seven, this is the big one. This is what you need to make sure your client knows on day one. No work associated with the change request will begin until formal approval is received. When a change is approved, the project plan will be adjusted, the amount authorized will be subtracted from the change budget and added into the project budget. And so I said see time and cost section for more information on the change budget, but we talked about that. So the other thing that you need to also establish is what is your criteria for change? What defines a change? Because what that means to you and what that means to the client, two totally different things. So it's important that you all agree on what is that criteria. And basically the ones that I use are that any change to the statement of work, I don't care what it is, any change to the statement of work is a change. Could be the personnel, it could be a contradiction to information that you had in there that's wrong, um, changes to an accepted deliverable, time lost due to things like the systems went down for some reason. The clients, you're working on the, <coughs> excuse me, working on the client's site and their system goes down and so you lose a day, that's a change. If, it, if it's gonna impact your schedule, that's a change. So, in summary, how do you stop scope creep once and for all? Those six principles of John Keene's all uh, contribute to stopping scope creep. I changed them a little bit to apply to WordPress because that's my jam and what I do. The two most critical principles are define the job in detail and establish and stick to a change procedure. At WP Roadmaps, we use six tools to define the job in detail and a drill down approach and that is the project question, the proposal questionnaire, the proposal, the project definition questionnaire, the statement of work, work breakdown structure, and those content gathering forms. And if you don't build a, a single page until you have all of those things done, then you'll be able to get that website built a whole lot faster. And you'll, you know what the other part is? You end up getting it done closer to what your client envisioned than if you didn't follow these, this sort of drill down procedure where you're getting into the, you know what, <laughs> here's what's funny. Everybody thinks that quote is, the devil's in the details. Go, if you go to Bartlett's book of quotations, you notice that big fat book's got all quotations in every, that's not the quote. The quote is God is in the details. And somebody changed it at some point and everybody's picked up on that one because it's excruciating. Getting into that detail and talking about it and trying to get it out of the client is very painful, but it is so worth it if you just make yourself stick to it. So your change control process should be outlined in the project definition documents and reviewed with the client so you're setting that expectation up front. We know it's gonna change. We know it's gonna change. And here's our criteria for that. So, the end. <laughs>